let me pose a couple of questions to you, and then I need to open the floor because this is really yours. These are speakers who bring to you information that in some ways re still remains contentious. We don't know how consciousness and mind originates, is generated from, is channeled into this thing called brain-mind. And certainly we don't know what happens after death. Is there preservative consciousness or is there not? Is this the epiphenomenon or the experience of the dying brain? Or perhaps is this really pulling back a veil to elucidate an element of consciousness that is not available to us in our more cognitive day-to-day -day experiences? Is this a neuroscientific task? Is this a medical task? Is this a task of philosophy? Before I open the floor for questions and answers, which I strongly encourage, let me put out a couple of things that I think are important. The question here is, what do these studies actually teach us in some way? Well, one, I think that what we know is that we're still trying to unravel the mystery of consciousness, particularly phenomenal consciousness. That is to say, not just how the brain works, but what is this thing that brain experiences that makes mind? Uh, what is that? Generated? Channeled? Perceived? Some combination of all of the above? Our decade of the brain that we had from 1990 to 2000 did very, very little to elucidate those questions, but it did do an awful lot to tell us how brains work, could work, and perhaps opens up some new technology. What do we do with that technology? Realistically, what this tells us that we know that death is inevitable, but is the loss of consciousness inevitable? Moreover, if in fact what these studies might suggest to us is that consciousness represents some unique force that does not necessarily need to be embodied, then my question to you is could we download such a thing onto technology so as to persist beyond our body? to persist in some other form, not necessarily a form that exists out there, but maybe that exists in here. And if we can do this, should we? And if we can do this, who should we do this for? All of us? Some of us? Well, if it is in fact a dying brain then, then is this really a tool to study what consciousness means when we're alive? Do we have this other dimension of consciousness that allows a higher level of perception, cognition? Can we harness that? And in some way if we can harness that, what should we do with it? If in fact consciousness is indeed preservable, and if this then teaches us not to fear death, then what does that do for our value of life? Please understand that Anything that we do that has the potential to smack of the good can be bastardized and purloined to turn right around. If, in fact, we fear not death, then why should we value life when, in fact, what waits beyond, so to speak, is better? Should that demean the quantity of our life? Or is it that, as we heard, we should reflect back on our lives with a greater value? Understanding the value of the gift of consciousness, whether preservative or not, as a dynamic that grounds us to the biopsychosocial fabric of our unity as human persons. These are profound questions. There are questions that exist at the intersection of science and the humanities. There are questions that exist at the interface of our technological capacity and our ethical moral integrity. Science strides on by its very nature philosophically. It raises questions, opposes these questions, puts these questions to work in the anthropological sphere, and seeks to do this in a way that is ethically, both technically right and morally good. Because we can do something, should we? What do these studies of consciousness imply? And even if, even if, these studies suggest to us that this is the effect of the dying brain, and that may teach us that that process of death is not necessarily a bad thing, but is one that is experientially and phenomenologically beneficent, good, pleasant. What lesson do we take from that about the value of our life, our treatment of others, and how we regard this thing called our own finitude? With that, ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do is open up the floor for questions.
Um, indeed, spontaneous out-of-body experiences have been reported. These are spontaneous in the sense that they are not occurring at the time of uh, emotional distress or a life-threatening event, as occurs with a near-death experience. There's actually been a number of study those, uh, studies of spontaneous out-of-body experiences where targets were placed in other rooms and people that believed they could have a spontaneous out-of-body experience were asked to try to identify the target. Now, those studies were conducted some decades ago, and uh, in general, the results of those studies were negative. In other words, they did not seem to be able to be evidential in their observations of a target in another room. And again, I would emphasize these are spontaneous out-of-body experiences, OBEs, not the OBEs that occur with uh, near-death experiences. Um, having said that, uh, another website I have in addition to my near-death experience research foundation is OBERF.org, or Out of Body Experience Research Foundation. In nearly a decade that that website's been up, we've encouraged people to share those types of experiences. So I, you know, I feel I have a somewhat unique perspective on on out of body experiences as they occur spontaneously. We've actually had uh, close to 2,000 experiences shared on that website. An awful lot of of what people consider to be spontaneous out of body experiences are probably. Uh, hypnagogic or hypnopompic experiences, meaning they occur at a time you're either falling asleep or, or coming out of sleep, and I'm, I'm suspicious they may be uh, what's called REM intrusion. In other words, they may be variations of dreams and aren't particularly evidential. And that's actually been the majority of experiences shared on my website. However, there has certainly been a substantial number of out-of-body experiences occurring you know, at all times during waking consciousness that seem highly evidential. Uh, that seem medically inexplicable, and so I would certainly agree that that certainly would be fruitful for additional study. There's no question that from these uh, minority of experiences that I've seen, uh, the out-of-body experience obs observations can be extremely evidential. Uh, very often, both in NDEs and these types of OBEs, people can describe seeing like tops of buildings or seeing from top down in a way that that would have been impossible for them to see or be aware of. And yet when these people that have spontaneous OBEs, as with near-death experiencers having OBEs, if they go back and, ch and check the area that they saw, which, which they could not have otherwise seen, uh, almost invariably they find that it's exactly as they saw. So my, my impression about spontaneous OBEs is that uh, you know, there are certainly some of them that are a part of the spectrum of experiences that near-death experiences are. And I am increasingly convinced that the common denominator is that they're spiritual experiences. May I? One of the things that keeps coming up, you've raised an interesting question about collaboration between groups of scientists, and not only scientists, I mean social scientists as well, to then interpret these things in a socio-cultural framework. We had spoken earlier about what the brain does and what the brain doesn't do. Not to default to a mariological position, because I don't think that way. But there are brain networks we know that deal with boundaries, bodily boundaries, certainly, the, the embodied self. You know where you stop and that chair starts, for example. We all do. And this is very important. And one of the things that the Noor Foundation is dedicated to doing in conjunction with the New York Academy of Sciences is putting forth a symposium series over the next year that actually identifies different constructs of this notion of the self. What is the self? Well, many of these phenomenon that are reported as out-of-body experiences may involve some distortion of those neural networks that provide some phenomenal reality, some cognition of the boundary of self and non-self. And we know that if, in fact, those are impacted in some way, if those are impaired, if those are changed, that those boundaries become somewhat amorphous. And as a consequence, individuals then experience a dissolution of their embodied self into what appears to be a more diffuse realm. Are those out-of-body experiences writ large? Well, perhaps there are some cases that are in fact wholly representative of that. Perhaps part of that phenomenon exists as indeed the brain undergoes sort of a panencephalopathic hypoxia that they occur at the moment of death. Is that contributory to the overall experience? Yes. Is it wholly explanatory of the phenomenon? Not completely. But I think it needs to be taken into regard, and that may perhaps be the vector by which neuroscience comes into it to try to determine what networks are involved and how they function. Um, I've studied that, and we asked people to briefly describe their religious background in terms of being conservative, fundamentalist, moderate, or liberal. 
and we ask for them to define that, that category of religious belief at the time of the experience and then the time that they shared their experience, typically many years later. Uh, and, and we also have a text box so people can go into some further detail about their religion. Uh, based on what I'm seeing, and, and, and there's certainly been lots of other prior scholarly study about this, uh, the content of the, the, the probability of having a near-death experience at the time of a life-threatening event seems to be completely independent of prior religious belief or lack of religious belief, such as with atheists. Uh, they seem to be equally probable of, of experiencing a near-death experience when they, when they have a close brush with death. Uh, in fact, that's true. We have about three dozen near-death experiences that were shared from non-Western cultures. And so these were people that were um, uh, predominantly Muslim but may come from a variety of other, uh, we have some Hindus and, and some other uh, religious beliefs. And uh, from the three dozen near-death experiences we have from these non-Western countries, it appears that the content of their NDEs are strikingly similar to the traditional Western NDEs. So the, uh, intriguingly, the, the pre-existing belief system that they have, religious belief or even belief about what will happen when they die, even if they know about near-death experiences and think that that may have any influence at all on what will happen with I die, no matter what their prior belief system, their experience seems to be the same. And in fact, that, that's further substantiated by a study I did of very young children, age five and less. These very young children are somewhat of a blank slate in terms of cultural upbringing. To them, a very young children, age five and less, and actually the average and median age was three and a half years old. To these very young children, they, death is an abstraction, unknown and unknowable in general at that young age. They've almost certainly never heard of near-death experience. They have much less cultural influence, much less uh, religious upbringing. And yet, with the 33 elements of near-death experiences that I compared in that group of very young children, age five and under, to the uh, th same 33 elements in older children and adults, the content of their experiences was identical. I think just to add uh, very briefly, I mean, from, from my perspective, um, I interviewed about five or 600 people who'd had these near-death and out-of-body experiences, as, you know, basically like with Jeff Long, people who sent us these accounts. And I definitely found a... Um, trend in that group where there really wasn't much of an association with their religious belief. Um, there were some who were absolute atheists and it was really interesting because they would tell me I had this experience, I don't really know why I had it because I didn't expect me to have one of these. Now some of them were transformed and they developed faith afterwards and some of them still persisted in being atheists and just said I don't know why it happened to me, it was really interesting, it really happened, I did see this person of light, they were beautiful, but I still don't think there's anything. So it was interesting. And then in the study that we did in Southampton, which was really a pilot study about 10 years ago, we looked at um, the survivors of cardiac arrest and people who had near-death experiences. And essentially, none of them had, it, the experiences they had had no relationship with their religious background at all. Um, it was a small study, but it was an, an indicator. Yeah. So it seems to be a very universal phenomena that when people die, uh, this is what they experience. Uh, I may also add, if I may, I'd like to also add that it seems to have very much of a sort of a mystical type of experience where it changes the individual. So putting aside what it means above and beyond after death, but certainly for those who come back, it leads to a much more positive outlook on life, less of fear of death, more altruism, less material interest, and really nicer, happier people. And they're really, really positively enhanced uh, by this experience. So what I've come to conclude is, I, we don't know exactly what happens really after death, but certainly at least for the majority of people, death seems to be a pleasant experience, putting aside those who do, you know, something like, I don't know, traumatic suicide or something like that. There are case reports of people who have neg negative experiences. But for those of us who die naturally, we shouldn't be afraid of death. It's a part of our existence. And um, it seems to be a very pleasant uh, experience for people. One of the things that's certainly on the lips of most of science, which is, well, how many? In other words, how many times do I have to go to the moon, bring back a rock to know the moon exists? I think that there are a number of individuals in the scientific community, if not a growing number of individuals, who would accept the, the veracity of these patients' reports, and as such, this needs to be something to be examined. The question may not be whether or not it happens. The real question is, what's happening? And then, of course, the larger question is, and what does that mean? Gentlemen. Yeah, yeah I, an interesting question, you know, at what level of, of accumulated evidence is necessary before one ultimately says that these near-death experiences are medically inexplicable, that there appears to be, uh, 
as, as they consistently suggest, uh, the potential for consciousness to exist apart from the physical body and the way we understand the physical body and physical consciousness today. Um, I would uh, first of all point out that the overwhelming majority of people who personally experience a near-death experience, they're done. In general, they don't have to go read textbooks or scholarly articles to accept the reality of their experience. We ask our people in our survey, you know, what do you think about the reality of your experience? And the bottom line, it's about 98, 99 percent um, believe that it is is real. And so, uh, and that's true for the physicians and scientists, ministers that have shared their near-death experience with me. Uh, they accept its reality almost uniformly, and it, it's based on their personal experience, not because they, they read some articles about it or accumulated additional study. I think you raise a very, very good point with that question. I think it's really, it, because this is evidence that's based uh, on, on experiences where you cannot duplicate in a laboratory, uh, it's a little bit of a, a shift in, in terms of how we scientists study things. We were much more comfortable, of course, setting up reproducible studies where we can observe and multiple people can observe it and study it. And of course, that would be unethical to study near-death experience that way. So I think it becomes a certain level of subjectivity at what level the, of evidence do you need. Uh, personally, I can tell you from my point of view, and consistent with the overwhelming majority of people that have experienced a near-death experience, I believe it's medically inexplicable, and I believe that it's an important uh, it's an important line of future research where we can learn a tremendous amount. So uh, that that's that's where I'm coming from. That, and, it, and it's just hard to say. It's up to there's there's going to be there there's certainly going to be people that no matter how overwhelming the evidence are going to reject it simply because it's inconceivable to them in such a radical shift in what their belief is. And then, like I said, there's going to be other people that actually felt that way until they had a near death experience, and then very very quickly they they'll accept its reality. And I'll just say very quickly, I think it depends on the question you're trying to ask. I mean, some people in the audience may be aware that you know, we've designed a study where we've put these hidden pictures in, in resuscitation areas, and we're trying to see if people who have cardiac arrest, who claim to see doctors and nurses working on them, do they see these pictures? So I guess you could argue, since that's not been done before, even if we had one single hit, then that may be a positive. But I think it depends very much on the question you're trying to, to answer. Um, for the perspective of I think what we do, and I think what is becoming more and more interesting, is that as we're pushing back the boundaries of life and death, pushing through into death, it's really the way I think of it is like in the old days when people were heading out from Europe to come and discover the Americas. They didn't know what was lying ahead. They just went ahead and to discover what was there. And what we're discovering, which is astonishing, is that even though people have been dead for periods of time that were thought never to be possible before, yet we can bring them back to life again. And more importantly, their consciousness and their mind, the thing that made them into who they were, hadn't disintegrated, hadn't disappeared. And I think that is a very important point. And what's also becoming really incredible, I'd like to share this with you for a moment. People are looking at devising drugs that you could potentially give to someone as they've died, which will uh, inhibit the pathways, the chemical pathways inside the brain cells that lead the brain cells to become damaged. And so, for example, one thing that's already being done is cooling people. By cooling them, we're making their brain cells hibernate. That's what Mr. Turolosi received, and that's what really helped. But they're going even steps further to give drugs that would prevent brain cells from disintegrating very quickly. So in the future, you may have a situation, and not that distant future, where you give someone an injection as they've died, and then suddenly they're dead. There's nothing going on. But actually, um, you can bring them back to life instead of, say, an hour or two, maybe 24 hours. So you can preserve them for that long. Then the question you have is, well, what happened to that conscious thinking being? And so we're having to redefine even our definitions of death. Maybe we have to, for example, define death not based upon some arbitrary biological process because those boundaries will keep on getting pushed further and further ahead. Maybe we have to define death as when does human consciousness cease? Does it cease? And if so, when? And those are some of the interesting things that are going on. I mean, you've raised a good point. I mean, obviously, the medical nemesis since antiquity has been death. And although in the past hundred years we've shifted more to a nosological model where we look at disease, one of the things that's happening is as we advance our technologies, and the neurotechnologies, genetic technologies, nanotechnologies, and even cyber technologies that would perhaps allow the sustainability of a downloaded form of consciousness into a non-biological and silicon entity, what we do is exactly as Dr. Parnia has said. We expand those boundaries. We push the frontiers. And we have to be cautious because, in fact, the risks at the frontiers will always outweigh the benefits because of the viability of the unknown.
I do a great Jack Nicholson impersonation, but I'm not going to do it now. It's, can you handle the truth? <laughs> and so uh, that remains a question on the lips, and I think that's something we need to take home with us. It's a good question. I think one of the things that you have to think about the way brains work, uh, particularly with regard to cognition, is that it's an essentially noisy environment. I mean, we're being bombarded by stimuli all the time. In fact, you're just standing there. I would submit to you that you're probably feeling your shoes on the floor, your hands in your pockets, hearing the noise in the background, trying to concentrate on what I'm saying and figuring out where you're going to go to get something to drink after this conference. And all of those things impinge. So if I asked you to remember your best friend's name from third grade, you'd have to think about that for a while, just like I forgot the title of Dr. Parnia's book, which he's never going to let me forget. And so. One of the things that happens is we, we have to sift through, and you know this phenomenon, tip of the tongue phenomenon, trying to remember a street, what's the directions. So it may very well be that much of the clarity that we see during not only near-death experiences, but other forms of experiences that allow something of uh, a more focused conscious state, in fact, unveil, unleash, disinhibit much of the processes by which quote, pure cognition can occur. And this has been a really interesting field of research for consciousness and cognitive studies that are trying to reverse engineer some of those processes to try to streamline the way we use our brain. These studies are usually referred to as augmented cognition, and they're of broad interest not only to the neuroscientific community, but also to the public at large. And then, of course, this brings that cat out of the bag about the whole, well, is it treatment or is it enhancement? And that's certainly a topic for uh, another seminar or at least another discussion. But I think that's what you're really seeing is that here, once again, in pulling back one curtain, we allow perhaps the brain mind to be a bit less noisy. And in fact, what we may be seeing is a pure form of consciousness and cognition without some of the overriding noise that allows us to signal process all that much clearly. Hope I answered your question. Good. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, you know, the night went very, very quickly, as it always does with such a provocative and interesting topic. And my hope for you is that, indeed, we may have answered some things, and certainly our expert speakers were certainly rich in their discourse, their answers, but more that we've sort of delivered a dialectic, literally that allowed something of a synthesis. Uh, you have a variety of different perspectives that have been offered, and hopefully we've been able to entertain a group of different orientations and insights. But the idea is twofold. Number one, Let's ask some more questions, both of what we think about the nature of the human being, brain, mind, consciousness, self, and of course the way we position our lives given the boundaries of coming into being and the finitude that reaches the end. What does that mean with regard to the way science can approach these questions and should? What does that mean for the way we take this information and embody it and use it in our daily moral and practical discourse and interactions with meaningful selves and others. What does that really mean when we look at the nature of what it means to be and somewhat Shakespeareanly philosophically not to be? These are not only philosophical questions, they embrace the three tasks. The three tasks of philosophy, to reiterate, are what we know and how we know it, how we use it and apply it in the human condition, and how we use it for the good. Any scientific outcome, any research, any values, exists within that matrix. And so hopefully the information you've heard tonight is provocative. It stimulates further thought, stimulates further inquiry. You need to recognize that science by its very nature is self-critical and needs to be self-revisionist. And when it fails to do so, it reverts to dogma. But I think one of the things that emerges from this almost universally is that these represent common experiences that are grounded in our biopsychosocial being. And as such, this may relate us to each other far more than it separates. And indeed, that's one of the reasons why we brought you here. The overwhelming mission statement of the Noor Foundation, unity amidst plurality, and certainly seeking those types of questions that stimulate us to find both individual meaning and meanings as individuals who exist in groups of culture and society. Hope you've enjoyed this evening. I'd like to thank the New York Academy of Sciences for their generosity and hospitality, and certainly the Noor Foundation for supporting this. Thanks to our wonderful speakers, Dr. Parnia and Long. And thanks to all of you, both for sitting with us tonight, sharing this information with us, being a part of this, and also for sharing your questions.